Thank you. Thank you very much. And good evening. Two months ago, I took office promising a new beginning, a government that is committed to fundamental change, a government that is fiscally responsible, a government that uses common sense, and a governor who keeps her promises. Budgets are more than just numbers. They are the balance sheet of our principles, the ultimate statement of our priorities. This is where government puts its money where its mouth is. Only it's not the government's money. It's your money. That's why I'm here tonight. This is the first time in memory that a governor has delivered a budget message to a joint session of the legislature in the evening during prime time when it can be broadcast across the state to families in their homes. Traditionally, this speech is given at 2 p.m. when few of you have the opportunity to listen. What you get are a few sound bites on the evening news and an article in your local paper. I ask to give this speech at this time because you deserve to hear directly how your tax dollars are being spent and why. I would like to thank the legislature for agreeing to this change. This is the beginning of three and a half months of dialogue, debate, and discussion between my administration, the legislature, and the various interest groups that have traditionally driven the policy agenda in Trenton. And this time, you, as citizens, must be involved too. Fifty years ago, the first computer was built. It was a mammoth machine, 100 feet long, 10 feet high, 3 feet deep. Today, the computer world has changed. Computers the size of that PC right there have the same capacity as a supercomputer installed eight years ago that took up two rooms at Princeton's Forrestall Center. Microchips are in, mainframes are out, but not in government. Government in New Jersey is an expensive to run, slow to respond, antiquated mainframe. It fills two rooms when it needs to take up a single desk. With this budget, we begin the process of remaking government, of making the machinery of government smaller, smarter, faster, more responsive to you, and less costly. We have no other choice. Taxes in New Jersey, the cost of running the machinery of government, are too high. High taxes drive jobs out of New Jersey and discourage new businesses from coming in. They make it hard for a young family to buy a home and for senior citizens to keep them. They force our children to look for job opportunities far away from their homes. If we were to follow the pattern set by governors and legislatures over the past quarter century, state spending would double over the next eight years. The state budget would be $32 billion, $4,100 for every man, woman, and child in this state. Income, sales, or business taxes would have to go up $3 billion, $3 billion every 30 months just to keep up. That cannot happen. You cannot afford it. Our children cannot afford it. You elected me to prevent it. I will not let it happen. This budget is going to go down, not up. There is only one way to cut government spending, and that is to cut the amount of tax dollars that we take out of your pocket. The more money you have to spend, the more the economy will grow. You elected me to cut taxes and government spending in order to create jobs and stimulate economic growth, and that's exactly what my tax cut will do. Your legislature, under Senate President Don G. Francesco and Assembly Speaker Chuck Hightayan launched New Jersey on the road to economic recovery by rolling back the sales tax in 1992 and cutting business taxes last summer. I'm grateful to the legislature 
for quickly approving the 5% income tax cut and the corporate tax rollback I called for in my inaugural address. The Senate finished the job today by approving the elimination of all income taxes for the 380,000 New Jerseyans earning less than $7,500 a year, mostly senior citizens, students, and people working their way off welfare. Those tax cuts are just the first step. I promised you an income tax cut ranging from 30% for low and middle income families to 20% for high income families by 1997. With this budget, I am asking the legislature to take the second step. I am calling for a second income tax cut effective January 1st, 1995. This tax cut would give more to the low and middle income taxpayer who need the tax relief most. My plan would triple the current income tax cut to 15% for families learning, earning less than $80,000 and for individuals making less than $40,000. The cut would be 7.5% for families earning between $80,000 and $150,000 and individuals earning between $40,000 and $75,000. Those in the highest tax bracket would get a 6% cut. And make no mistake about it, I will call for a third tax cut next year. For democracy to work, those who ask for your votes must keep their promises. I will keep mine. <laughs> Not everyone will be happy with this budget. You will hear complaints about particular cuts, questions about why I kept my promise to cut taxes. But tax cut or no tax cut, we would have had to cut spending this year. We must cut spending to close the $2 billion structural deficit caused by past over-reliance on one-shot revenues and by a past failure to limit the growth of government spending to the growth in tax revenues. With this budget, we stop spending more money than we take in. With this budget, we reduce our reliance on one-shot revenues by nearly one-half. We are changing the way we fund pensions and health benefits for retirees in a way that will save you more than $600 million this year and more than $3.5 billion over the next four years without affecting benefits for a single retired worker. We are not taking a penny out of the pension system. We will continue to pay for health benefits on an annual basis. We also address a fundamental inequity in our retiree benefit system by requiring teachers and state workers to pay the same amount toward their pensions that police and firefighters and non-government workers already pay. I know that property tax, taxes are a concern to you. When I urge the legislature to enact a retroactive tax cut, I promised that we would not play the shell game of cutting one tax by raising another. I kept that promise. This budget provides a net increase of more than $100 million in resources available to local governments, which I urge them to use to hold down property taxes. I am recommending the elimination of desegregation aid and a partial phase-out of density aid to municipalities. 
I am also proposing a 33% reduction in the transition aid to 265 school districts that was supposed to expire completely this year under the 1990 law. This will enable us to shift $28 million more into the 30 poorest school districts. This is a good faith effort toward complying with the Supreme Court order to close the funding gap between the richest and the poorest school districts. We will write a new school aid law over the next year that defines what a thorough and efficient education should mean for every child, no matter where he or she lives. But you know, and I know, that money and more money alone is not the answer. Accountability is. In a school system that already spends more than any other child, than, per child than any other state, we have to resort to accountability. We must teach children to read in the early grades so we do not have to spend tens of millions of dollars more on remedial education in high school and colleges. We need to inject competition into our schools by developing alternatives like magnet schools and charter schools and voucher systems. And we need to understand that salaries and benefits for school personnel are growing so rapidly that they eat up any increase in state aid long before the dollars reach the classrooms. School districts, like municipalities and counties, must find ways to cut costs. If I can find a way to balance my budget while cutting taxes by $589 million, your schools, counties, and municipalities can find ways to balance their budgets without raising taxes. In fact, I challenge those who are putting so much ener energy into criticizing my spending cuts to use that energy to find the cost savings in their own budgets that we all know are there. It is not impossible. I said I would cut spending in the governor's office by 20%, and I did it. Union Township, which I visited last month, spends 15% less than the statewide average to educate its children. That's because it pays teachers extra to handle administrative duties that other districts pay vice principals higher salaries to perform. We all know that municipalities and schools can save money by regionalizing services. My treasurer is willing to provide efficiency audit teams to help your local governments identify cost savings. But the best way to find savings is to do what we are doing. Set up broad-based citizen groups within your own towns and school districts to come up with creative ideas that save money, that challenge the old way of doing things. Particip participatory democracy works. This budget proves it. Before my administration even took office, a citizen's budget committee co-chaired by Candy Strait and Andrew Chapman identified hundreds of millions of dollars in potential budget savings. Valuable ideas came in from you through town meetings, call-in shows, and tens of thousands of letters that were sent to the Our Tax Dollars program. Nicholas Gordon of Fort Lee, who is with us tonight, wrote to ask why the state is spending so much for a basic skills assessment test for college freshmen that duplicates the test we give to 11th graders. Nicholas, you're right. <laughs> That test is gone, and you just saved the state $1.2 million a year. <laughs> Nancy Burwell of Belleville, who was also in the gallery, called 101.5 while I was on the air to suggest that we bring in a company to audit the state's gov state government's phone bills. Good idea, Nancy. We expect to save $1.5 million, maybe more, by that.
Paul Perekka Jr. of Millville, who was also here, asked why the state of New Jersey was running marinas in competition with private enterprise. Good question, Paul. We're going to privatize those marinas in Leonardo and Forked River. Expected sale price, $7 million. We thank you. Nobody wrote in to suggest that we can save more money by continuing the R tax dollars program, but I figured that one out for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Write me with your ideas. The address is R tax dollar, CN 096, Trenton, New Jersey, 08625. One of the most intriguing letters to R tax dollars came in December from Frank P. Merlo, a graduate professor of education at Montclair State College. Professor Merlo can't be with us tonight because he's teaching a school finance course. But listen to what he wrote. The present autonomy of the state's public higher education institutions makes the Department of Higher Education somewhat obsolete and relegates it to a make-work function to justify its existence. Professor Merlo, you're right. As of July 1st, the State Department of Higher Education will no longer exist. I am proposing the creation of a Council of College Presidents to replace the needlessly duplicative oversight now provided by the Chancellor's Office and the Board of Higher Education. Taxpayers will save millions of dollars by cutting this excessive bureaucracy, but more important, we will put responsibility and accountability for our colleges where it belongs, with the individual college presidents and their boards of trustees. In In 1986, state college autonomy, the 1986 state college autonomy law gave colleges responsibility for greater self-governance and for developing their own unique missions. They have succeeded admirably. Rutgers, NJIT, UMDNJ are stronger than ever. Montclair is about to become the first state college to earn university status. Trenton State is no longer one of the best kept secrets in higher education. Community colleges are thriving. Our commitment to higher education is stronger than ever. In fact, tuition increases will be limited to 3.5% this year, the lowest increase in at least 10 years. And that's because we recognize that education is the cornerstone of our future. We must provide quality education from preschool to graduate school if New Jersey is to compete in the 21st century. That <laughs> the Department of Higher Education isn't the only cabinet agency that should be eliminated. The Department of the Public Ad Advocate has outlived its usefulness. We will... We will continue to meet fully this state's constitutional responsibility to provide legal counsel to the poor and to patients involuntarily committed to mental hospitals. We can do so by transferring the Office of the Public Defender and all mental health screening services to the Department of State. Federally funded programs for the legal protection of persons with disabilities will be privatized and will continue stronger than ever. But the Division of Rate Counsel will be abolished because it duplicates the role of the Board of Regulatory Commissioners.
and we will no longer use your tax dollars to finance lawsuits by one government agency against another government agency. <laughs> which then has to use more tax dollars to defend itself in a court system also financed by you. We can find better ways to spend our money. It also t is time to get government out of businesses it should not be running and give private companies and nonprofits the opportunity to compete to provide services at lower costs. Speaking of better ways to spend our money, public television cannot be truly independent as long as it is funded by government dollars. With this budget, we begin a two-year transition toward making New Jersey Network financially and politically independent, like its sister stations in New York and Philadelphia. Government control of the media went out with Pravda. I am... I am cutting state aid to New Jersey Network by $2 million to start the transition from tax dollar to private contributions. I will lend my personal support to New Jersey Network's fundraising drive. Privatization makes sense in other areas, too. In addition to the two marinas, I plan to turn over six state daycare centers to nonprofit agencies. I plan to close seven of the state's 39 armories. The Russians are not coming, except perhaps as tourists. <laughs> Perhaps the most exciting privatization initiative is a plan to establish a community-based drug treatment facility adjacent to the Hudson County Jail for 400 medium security state prisoners. Two-thirds of the 25,000 inmates in our state prison system have drug or alcohol problems, yet the Department of Corrections has just 250 substance abuse treatment slots. If we keep releasing prisoners with drug or alcohol problems, we know they'll go right back to crime. This new medium security facility, coupled with an expansion of available beds and halfway houses, will give us the opportunity to send prisoners with drug and alcohol problems to treatment programs before they come up for parole. The message will be clear. If you don't get clean and sober, you have no chance for parole. It's as simple as that. This is just one example of how government needs to get smart about spending a few dollars more now to avoid spending a fistful of dollars later. Correction spending has quadrupled since 1980. Yet we have been doing very little to prevent youngsters from entering the criminal justice system in the first place, and even less to prevent inmates from going back to a life of crime after they are paroled. My Attorney General and Human Services Commissioner are heading an advisory council on juvenile justice that will develop boot camps and other alternatives to put first-time offenders back on the right track. I also want to require inmates to get their high school equivalency diploma or improve their reading by three grade levels as a condition for their parole. You can't get a very good job with a seventh grade reading level, which is the average in our prisons. Those who already have high school diplomas can tutor those who need help. We must get smarter about funding health care, too. We will save money by moving our Medicaid population to managed care, but more important, we can give our poorest families the opportunity to take their children to doctors for regular checkups 
instead of having to wait for their children to get sick enough to go to a hospital emergency room. Similarly, advocates for the mentally ill and the developmentally disabled have been pushing for years to expand community-based services rather than continue to pour hundreds of millions of tax dollars into expensive, outmoded institutions. It is time to consider closing some institutions and putting more money into the community to establish a continuum of care. Throughout this budget, I have, tried, I have tried to invest money now in programs that will pay dividends in the future money that will multiply and create opportunities in the private and nonprofit sector. That's why I increased advertising for tourism by $1 million, knowing that every dollar spent promoting our second largest industry generates 70 new dollars for New Jersey businesses. That's why I put an extra half million dollars into promoting our agricultural industry. That's why I'm devoting $250,000 to empower the business ombudsman to cut through red tape and prove that New Jersey is a business-friendly state. That's why I doubled the State Planning Commission's budget to $1.4 million. And that's why I refused to cut our billion-dollar capital spending program, including the $565 million we will spend on transportation programs. And oh yes, there's a $30 million set aside this year to fix all those winter potholes, including $10 million for counties and municipalities. I am proud of the work we've done in putting together a forward-looking budget in just two months. I want to particularly thank my treasurer, Brian Clymer, my cabinet, and their staffs. In many ways, this is a transition budget, one put together to close the structural deficit we inherited with the least possible pain. We did limit the pain. School and municipal aid levels remain virtually unchanged. Homestead rebates are preserved. State worker layoffs caused by program cuts are projected at 600, and the final number could be less. But just as important, we are starting the process of bringing sanity to government spending here in the State House, and hopefully in your county courthouses, your town halls, and in your schools. Yes, we will have to make tough choices about spending priorities, but that's what a budget is. You make those choices every month when you pay your mortgage or your rent buy food and pay your utility bills first. Then you see if you have enough money to go on vacation or out to the movies. I'm talking about common sense, a sense too, all too uncommon in government. You don't spend more money than you're taking in. Government shouldn't either. I'm going to keep asking you for your ideas on what you want your government to do. My cabinet members will be reaching out to all New Jerseyans to ask fundamental questions about the programs and services they provide. Together, working with the legislature, we can turn this expensive to run, slow to respond, antiquated mainframe of a government into a smaller, smarter, faster, more responsive, and less costly modern machine. That's how I want us to remake government. Together, in public, in open debate with everyone at the table, that's what democracy is. That's how government should work. We're going to prove it here in New Jersey. Thank you for listening. Thank you for participating. God bless you, and good night.